Awesome. So we are looking forward to seeing you in Cambodia. Awesome. All right. Well, good morning. It's great to be with you here today. I've been waiting for 15 years to go to Cambodia and see what God is doing over there. So look forward to uh, some of you coming with us. And uh, we've got a lot of great things lined up, so don't miss it. This week, thanks again, we're going to hopefully be getting the bathrooms mostly done. So we've got the uh, tile going in and the cabinets and countertops and toilets and faucets and whatever else is going on. Lights were happening this week or electricity for the lights, I guess. But uh, so many good things. We're just grateful for all God. God is doing. Amen? All right. Well, scoreboard Sunday, church picnic afterwards, like Pastor David said, don't miss it. It's going to be at 10 a.m., one service, so the 9 and 1045, we're going to meet in the middle at 10, Espanol coming down, and don't be late. After it, we're going to have, you know, picnic lunch and inflatables and games and whatever outside, but don't be late for 10 o'clock because last scoreboard Sunday, we had almost 1,200 people here. And we're going to do one service this time. And so if you didn't know, we only have 800 chairs. And so <laughs> what that means is don't be late because you might be sitting on the floor or standing in the back. Also, that included kids. So we'll have them in some kids' rooms as well. But, uh, uh, you know, I'm just saying don't be late uh, unless you really want to stand in the back. Some of you are like, I've been wanting to sit even further back in service than I already do. Then show up late. That'll be fine. Uh, don't show up late. All right, it's going to be a great day, and we're, we're really looking forward to that. Uh, last week, we concluded with a very simple prayer, four words, help me, Holy Spirit. Come on, I saw so many. hope that was a blessing to you this week, and uh, still a great prayer to pray this week, by the way. Amen, thank you. Okay, you know, just one person believed it. Eddie switched zones on me. I didn't know. I heard that voice. I was like, I didn't know, but come on, that's a good prayer every day of your life. It's not just when you're in church. It's not just, by the way, when you're in trouble. It's a great prayer, we, even when things are going great. Help me, Holy Spirit. How do I steward what it is that you've entrusted to me? Amen? All right. Well, this is week six of our series on the seven churches of Revelation, and uh, it's been su such a joy for me. I was sharing with our pastors on Tuesday. Normally, we meet on Monday, but it was Memorial Day. Was that really just this last week? A lot of stuff has happened in my life since then, so I was forgetting that it was. But on Tuesday, I was sharing with them uh, how different this series has been. You know, we kind of just go in order, and each week we gather as pastors, typically on Monday morning, and uh, we, we print out the, the passage of Scripture, we read it together, we pray together, and we simply ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And then we take turns going around the room saying, this is something that jumped out to me, this is something I felt impressed in my spirit. And uh, just giving you, eventually, I'll get to the note sheet, but giving you some explanation on how things go around here. And when a few people notice the same thing, or when the Holy Spirit highlights a similar thing on different people's lives, we kind of know that he's speaking to us in that regard, and that's how we work on those kind of points. But let me just mention that I'm not telling you how I do my job to just tell you how I do my job. Some of you are like, I don't care. You know, you get on the airplane, the pilot's like, I'm going to take a left at Pittsburgh and a right at Kansas City. You're like, just get me wherever I paid for the ticket. Some of you are thinking the same thing right now. But I'm bringing it to you in this moment. Let me just say this. You don't need a Monday morning sermon preaching meeting with other pastors to participate in Bible study in that regard. You can get together with anybody else. It might just be you and your spouse or a family member, a friend. You can pray together, read the same verses of Scripture together, and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And in the same way he speaks to us, he can and will and wants to speak to you. And there's something that happens when we get together with other believers and we just pause long enough to do more than just read the verse of the day as we're going from one appointment to the next. And we can pause and pray and allow Holy Spirit to speak to us all. Because it's not just for pastors that he wants to speak to us, but he wants to speak to everybody. Well, I had 17 people that think he wants to speak. That's all right. Come on. We believe that, right? The Word of God is living and active, and so every time we pray, read, uh, He gives us that direction. So uh, today, I'll preach this week number six, and then we're going to pause for two weeks on this Revelation series. Next Sunday is our 
high school seniors graduation Sunday, and we're going to have six of those students preaching, so I'll be right there in my chair in the front row encouraging them, and so it's exciting to be part of what God is doing with them. And then on Father's Day, I know traditionally uh, Father's Day is not necessarily as well attended as Mother's Day, and uh, that's fine if you're gone, but if you're here, I really want to encourage you, be in the house of the Lord on Father's Day. We have one of my heroes, not just Darth Lee, missionary to Cambodia, but one of my, another one of my missionary heroes, Sam Johnson, will be be with us uh, with Priority One Building Bible Schools. Actually, uh, we built the floating school there in Cambodia. Uh, by the way, if you missed the Sunday that Darth was with us, it's the last Sunday of January. He was here at Celebration. Go back and watch it online. But Sam Johnson will be with us on Father's Day, and we're so excited. Can't think of a better way to uh, take a two-week pause on this series. Then I'll continue preaching. We'll finish up this series, and then we'll have Scoreboard Sunday. Amen? All right, Revelation chapter 3. If you have a Bible, you could turn there. If you're able, would you stand? And uh, let's read God's Word together. If you didn't bring your own Bible, we've got one prepared for you. It was a uh, big old digital electronic screen for you. Um, in case you grew up in the South or like a Pentecostal church, either way, didn't have to be a Pentecostal church from the South, but just either one of those, this is going to be your day. I think this is going to be a day of declarations. Now, if you grew up in an upper Midwest Norwegian Lutheran style church, this might freak you out because you're going to want to sit there and be just silent the whole day, and I don't want you to be, okay? So this is a day where uh, I'm just going to preach this kind of a little bit how I feel it, but I felt like as I was praying for you on, on Friday morning and finishing writing this, that there was a number of declarations that the Holy Spirit gave me to declare over your lives today, and so I'm going to pause a few times throughout the sermon and just declare those over your lives, and then we'll pray again at the end, all right? Amen. I said something significant uh, in the spiritual realm is going to happen. First service went a little bit long, and so this one uh, will probably as well, but that's okay. You're going to pay the same for it either way. Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 to 13, reading about the church in Philadelphia. The Bible says this, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David, who open, what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Verse 8, I know your deeds. See, I've placed you before you an open door so that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I'll make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you, since you've kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Verse number 11, I am coming soon. That was a good place for everybody to say amen, not just 13 people. Come on. I am coming soon, Jesus said. More of you got that on the second time. By the way, first service took them three tries before they realized what was going on. You are much smarter than them. Do we put both of these online? They're going to see that. All right. I love you both. <laughs> oh, hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who's victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Verse 13, the key once again for all of us, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And that's our prayer today. Amen. Let's pray to God one more time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship your son Jesus. We're thankful for the great revelation of Jesus that we have through the help of Holy Spirit. We ask now, give us ears to hear what you're saying to everybody. In Jesus' name, we all said amen. 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 You may be seated. Grab that note sheet. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. By the way, there's only three points on the note sheet, but each point has two points. Um, because three times two is six, and there was no way I was going to do six points. Not because it's so long. I'm going to preach just the same either way, but I'm somebody that just doesn't think you can have six points in a sermon. It's the number of the devil. I'm not going to put it on the note sheet. That joke will be even funnier when I get to the end of the sermon, so just put that in the back of your hat, and I will come back around to that. Uh, Philadelphia is known as the city of brotherly love. As a sports fan... I would like to mention that Philly fans are not living up to their name. 
Amen. All the Vikings fans, we remember, right, just a few years back. We're going to leave it in the past, but we're still bitter about it. But we have prayer counseling and deliverance available to help you get over those hurts and hangups. Come on. But aren't you thankful that this text in Scripture is not referring to a city in Philadelphia with the Eagles, but rather a city in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, right? Philadelphos in Greek means one who loves his brother. And I found it interesting to note, more historical deal, the least amount that I'm going to give you on this today, but Pastor Dan had mentioned that this was the youngest of the seven cities and was founded, I thought this was great, as a missionary of Greek culture and language. So this word that Jesus said, you know, I've got the key, I've got open doors, was really all about him granting access to his church to do what he'd called them to do, which is interesting because this city was founded to be a missionary, to uh, further, to be an access point for Greek culture and society to spread. And Jesus said, even what you had planned, I'm going to do in a greater way. Now, if you notice, Philadelphia joined Smyrna as the only two churches that were not rebuked by Jesus. Remember, a few weeks ago, week number two was Smyrna. They were heavily persecuted, but they were not rebuked. The same is true here in Philadelphia. There is no rebuke for the believers at the church of Philadelphia. Unlike how I feel about the city today, Jesus said that church didn't have those problems. But the city had major issues. Now, a lot like today, right? Jesus referenced that synagogue of Satan. If you want more on that, go to week two. But they were hostile to the Christians. But before you think, oh, if, if society, the world around me, our city, our neighbors, oh, they, everybody hates me. Jesus said, that's okay. Even if others are hostile to Christians, Jesus has praise for the church of Philadelphia because they remained faithful in the face of severe trials. In fact, even though they had little strength, staying faithful became increasingly difficult. And Jesus said, you are doing a good job. So as you see there on the note sheet, I've got three points, but it's really six things. And we're praying, God, give us ears to hear. Give us receptivity in our spirits to hear what you're saying to us today. Amen? All right, number one and two, but number one on your note sheet, doors and deeds. Doors and deeds. Um, whether it's a key to the city or simply an open door, as I mentioned, Jesus is granting access. Verse 7 said, these are the words of him who's holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Now, we know in Scripture that it's not just that Jesus holds the key of David. That's a, a royal authority that Jesus has. Um, later, we can read right in the New Testament that Jesus defeated death, hell, and the grave. He took the keys of Hades. We, we know that Jesus proclaimed he is the door. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father unless you come through me. So whatever it is, Jesus is saying, I can grant what the world cannot. He says, I am the access that you need. We, we've heard of famous people who will receive a key to the city. In the South, I'd seen pastors who received a key to the city on behalf of their churches. And yet, I, I have a concern for the church of Jesus Christ in America these days that I think too many believers have pursued a key to the city in lieu of living with keys to the kingdom. That we've traded in our kingdom calling in order to just be liked by our neighbor. Now, I'm all for being honored where we live and work. I think Christians ought to show up early and stay late and work hard while we're there. Four people are bosses at their job. <laughs> I, I think we need to make positive contributions in our society. I think we ought to leave this place better than when we found it. However, I'm not for living, I'm not living for the approval of others at the expense of obeying Christ. I wrote this on my notes this morning. Let me give you a, a practical example. I don't need society's approval during Pride Month. But I also don't have to feel the pressure to be a jerk during the month either. Why? Because my king already has the key. You ever notice like the louder your kid yells, you know the weaker their case is? 
Some are like, listen to your preaching. Anyway, back off. <laughs> I'm going to get louder in point two. Okay, so, <laughs> right? Like, it doesn't matter what somebody else labels, calls, identifies. Like, you, you can't take the rainbow from God. You don't get to pick them up. Like, you can do all that stuff, but, but we, we quit being such a weak believer that you feel like God's going, oh, I guess I can't do anything this month. He has the key of David. He has the royal authority. And in fact, Jesus would say, I'm the door anyway. I grant what no one else can. What I open, no one can shut. And what I shut, no one can open. That's the king that I serve. I pray it's the king that you serve too. So we don't have to go around living in fear because God's already got it under control. Now, this reminds me, this whole idea of, of open doors. Jesus said, right, I'm going to open the door and nobody can shut it. How many people were here part of celebration back in 2017? Let me see your hand. Where are you at? Okay, a few more than in the first service. How many people were not part of celebration back in 2017? All right, how many people are Lutheran and won't raise your hand no matter what I ask? All right, just stare. Okay, that's fantastic. I saw one person was like, oh, he almost tricked me into raising my hand. Okay, I love that. Both services, I had one person that just did like a roller coaster wave. I was like, starting the worm. Anyway, okay. Back to my notes, right? In 2017, we received a word as a church. I had received it in my prayer time, but we received a corporate word as a church, and it was this, double doors, right? From Isaiah chapter 45. Do you remember that? In fact, today, it's still the uh, desktop picture on my laptop. So when I open my computer screen there, I see that day. It was April 22nd, 2017. That was the date that we had been there. But it was a double doors word from Isaiah chapter 45. Since there are a number of you that were not here in the church back then, let me reread the text to you because as I was praying, I couldn't help but think of the same thing. Now it's interesting to note after uh, in between services, there was a family that came up and they said, we, he showed me a picture on their fridge, still had a construction piece of paper, uh, construction paper, you know, not hard hat, but paper. Thank you. Appreciate that, Matt, for that agreement spirit. Okay. Um, and they had written on the words in crayon, double doors. And they said, we were part of the church in 2017. And then we moved to Florida and Hurricane Ian hit. And they said, just yesterday we came up here and we're telling our family about 2017, the word of the Lord, double doors. And they said, just this month, we got our house rebuilt. And they had their mom text a picture from their fridge in Florida, double doors written on it. So in case you weren't here back then, let me catch you up on Isaiah 45, because it was a word for our house, but then it had implications for our individual houses, right? Isaiah 45 said, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I've held, to subdue nations before him. That's what God's going to do. Not us, what he does. To loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors. Somebody said double doors. <laughs> so that the gates will not be shut. I couldn't help but notice that and think of what God has done time and time again in our church and in our lives. And, and I just want to say that I know uh, for many I just teach and I want to do my best to lay biblical groundwork. Sometimes I preach, which means I yell a little bit louder. But for other times I pray that it's a spirit of receptivity that we have, that it's more of a prophetic word. And this was one of those times where we felt like as a church. Now let me just say the way that receptivity is determined in our life, it's by our desire. A lot of times we've been sold a bill of goods that we think desire is just a feeling or an emotion. But did you know that desire is actually a discipline? It's a choice that we can make. This October the 7th will be 18 years that my wife and I will be married. And let me just talk about my life, not yours, but I suspect it's true. One of my spiritual gifts, suspicion. I suspect it's true in your life as well. In those 18 years, did you know that not every day was filled with the emotion, the feeling of desire to serve one another? It's true. We've had to make the choice. Some people say, why do married people fight all the time and you don't fight with your coworker? You know why? Because when you're married, you see each other at your worst. Morning and night. Come on, that's funny. You can laugh. That's all right. Just let it out. I can't laugh at that, but I think I'm going to be getting in trouble if I do. It's funny. Morning and night. 
It's a choice that we make, a decision, or really it's a discipline that says, I'm going to choose to prefer the other. I'm going to choose to serve. I'm going to choose to be filled with desire to serve them, not just wait to be served or when I feel like it. Did you know the same is true in our walk with the Lord? Not every day in the life of your pastor do I wake up and I'm just like, I'm so filled with desire to read the word today. Sometimes I'm tired. But I've made a decision. I've engaged discipline in my life that my interaction with the word of God is not based upon my feelings. I've chosen to discipline my calendar that says, when I rise, I pray and read the word. It's a decision, and it's increased my desire for my time with him. And by the way, the same is true no matter what area you think about coming to church. Maybe you're like, I don't want to. Let me just tell you something about your pastor. I don't always want to. (laughs) Wow, that felt good to just let that out, actually. (laughs) I didn't know that was in me, but there it is, right? But you know, sometimes uh, the difference will happen because you could come in and you could be like, eh, I wasn't really sure about today, or you can leave going, man, that was awesome. You know what the difference is? It's not really the power of God. It's your desire. It's your hunger, your openness, your receptivity to what he's doing. Because here's a newsflash. He always wants to talk to us. Did you know there's never a church service, there's never a private time of devotion that you're going to open the word, that you'll be in a corporate setting, and God's like, I don't want to say anything to them today. It's never going to be the truth. So if you leave, you're like, I didn't get anything. What was your level of desire? Because he wants to speak to us every day of our lives, not just in a pastoral meeting, not just in a sermon, but every day of our lives, he wants to talk with us. One-on-one, the creator of the universe wants to speak to us. But we've got to have that desire. And so, so as I was looking, it just reminded me that this year, we've determined that, that the word of the Lord for us this year is a do. Testimony, to testify, means God do it again with the same power and authority. And as I was meditating on this and praying for you, I began to think, God, what you did in 2017, we want you to do again today. Now, for those that weren't in the church in 2017, we had... uh, we, we had some land, five acres right up here on the, uh, on the top of the hill where Schneiderman's is. The, you know, Schneiderman's didn't used to always be there. That was our land. We used to mow that grass, and we received a phone call from uh, the Schneiderman's people, Jason Schneiderman, and they said, we want to buy your land. And we were like, well, we don't, it's not for sale. And they were like, here's how much money. We were like, we'll pray about it. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, somebody. And, and uh, what happened is a door was opened that we didn't force open. And because we weren't gonna use that land, that land became the seed that began to pave the way for the new building, for the kids wing and the chapel that's now used almost every day. What am I saying? God had stored up things, as I'll get to in a minute, that we didn't even know were there. It was riches hidden in secret places. I, I got to be honest with you, I, I mean, I always try to be, but I want to tell you that, that just a week ago, we received a phone call on our 58 acres of vacant land three miles south, just north of Walmart. It's not for sale, but somebody called, actually two different developers called the church and said, would you consider selling? Because now there's a lot of development going. If you haven't been down to that Walmart, you could go and see it on 205th. And um, uh, look at that. I memorized what street it's on this time. Remember that business meeting? Jason had to tell me what r- road it is. But anyway, 205th, if you drive, you can see what's going on. And here's what I just decided. I'm praying God do it again with the same power and authority. But it's not just for this house. Because it's like, I don't know if it's one year, three years, five years. Whenever God does it, I say, God, in your time, would you make it to where 
what we're not using wholly can be freed up so that we could do ministry in any way that you have for us. But here's what I know. It wasn't just what God did in 2017 for our house corporately. What he did corporately, he also began to do individually. And I was remembering this week how many people received pay raises, promotions. We had people in the church actually get double their salary in that year. And I was like, I didn't even know what was going on. Now, a lot of them happen to move away from Minnesota, so I'm praying God do it in the same power and authority, but just a little bit different <laughs> in Jesus' name, right? Like, let's keep the people in Minnesota. That's what I'm praying. But here's what I know. It's in his time. It's in his way. But when he does it, we don't have to force it or make it happen. This is what he says, right? That there are uh, hidden riches that he's reserved Where's the verse? There we go. I will give treasures of darkness and hidden riches in secret places. What am I saying? You know, 2017, maybe the economy was different. And I've heard from a lot of people, they're like, oh, well, look at the stock market now and look at mortgage price. I get all that stuff. But if it's riches hidden in secret places, it's not determined by our current economy or situation. It's what he wants to do for his glory and for his fame. So I, I know a lot of people have been going through some struggles. Maybe you've been wrestling with some big decisions in your business and different things going on. And so I'm going to pray that for our church, not just about 58 acres, because we don't know what, you know, Lakeville is going to do and that kind of stuff. But I'm praying for that spirit of expectation that says, God, whatever you have for us, we're open for. Only 17 people want to pay raise this year, I could tell. That's fine. I figure. Dave, I heard you loud and clear. Come on. But... But let, let's pray. Would you just bow your head and close your eyes here this morning? And uh, if you're in need or you just want any kind of miracle from the Lord, would you just open your hands towards heaven? And let me just pray this over us here today. Father, we come to you, your kids today, and you know the needs that we have. You know exactly what's going on. But we're praying, oh God, for double doors once again. We're praying for jobs. We're praying for increases. We're praying for ideas. We're praying for refunds. We're praying for bonuses. We're praying for deals. Whatever it is, God, we pray, do what only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. 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 All right. I want to finish and go to the next point. But I just want to mention it's not just doors. It's doors and deeds. So this is important because it's not just provision, it's what's the purpose for the provision. That's where we get off kilter. That's where we get out of line. That's where we get off base, right? When we just focus in on the provision, on the prosperity, and we separate from the purpose. And this is what he says. It's about doors and deeds. I know your deeds. Verse 8. What is the purpose for the provision? It's always, somebody say always, always. to do the will of our Father. It's always to do the will of our Father, to keep his word, not deny his name. Jesus was declaring an open door for the church, which represented, I love the way Pastor Dan gave this to me, unhindered opportunities for service to others. In a time where society was against those believers in Philadelphia, Jesus was granting unhindered opportunities for service to others. And we're praying the same is true, right? Even if we have little strength. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, uh, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. Even a little bit of strength is enough when we give it to him. All right, number two, waiting and working. Waiting and working. I'm gonna skip the synagogue of Satan part. Again, week two, go ahead and back and watch that. Remember, like some people are like, I go to First Church of Smyrna. I go to Pentecostal Church of Smyrna. I go to... Synagogue of Satan, Smyrna. Okay, anyway, week two, go back and watch it. It's still the same. There we go. He goes on to say, I'll make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Now, let me just say in my own brain, I was gonna say it in an American mindset, but I won't put it on you. I did on the first service, but maybe it's not you. But I think it's easy for us to read something like this and go, I can't wait till we get to rub it in their face. Some of you got real nervous, like, you didn't read the Bible like that too? Come on, don't judge your pastor with a spirit that you just didn't, right? How many of us are waiting? No, you're not going to raise your hand. We all are waiting for that day when we're like, nanny, nanny, poo, poo. We told you. How you like them apples, right? Like, we're waiting. By the way, 
Not a good attitude. I'm just confessing that in front of everybody, right? What are we, what's gonna happen? Jesus is not gonna make enemies bow at our feet to us. Rats. <laughs> so I got a few that I put on top of the list. No, what's gonna happen is one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We'll all be bowing to him together and it's in that moment that they'll realize that Jesus has loved us. Or maybe a better way to put it, we received his love for us. That it might not make sense to them, but how we're living today will one day, it'll all make sense to them. So keep on living for him, but it's not because they're gonna worship us, but one day we will all worship him, amen? amen. All right, so another way on this waiting and working, if I would've had a third and fourth or sub points, under point two, so now it's a lot of points, just write these two words down, faith, and faithfulness, faith and faithfulness. I think faith has a lot to do with our heart and faithfulness has a lot to do with our hand. Scripturally speaking, waiting, here he says, endure patiently. Waiting is not sitting idle just hoping something's gonna happen. It's not just tooling in our thumbs going on. Rather, waiting should actually be actively doing what we can because we know it will happen, right? Endure patiently. What does he say? Hold on to our faith. You know, delay can easily make us get antsy and grow weary. We don't like waiting at the microwave. My dad travels a lot for work and last flight coming home before he moved to Missouri, he got delayed in Charlotte multiple times, had to rent a car and drive home. Couldn't even make the last flight. Delays are never fun. Construction was going on yesterday, 35W North and construction delays. Nobody likes them. Two of you are like, I do, it gives me more time to just relax. Nobody likes you. I mean that with the love of the Lord. No one likes you. We all hate construction delays. <laughs> Proverbs 13, 12, let me give you a Bible verse that proves we don't like them. It says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. What did Jesus go on to say in verse 11? I'm coming soon, hold on to what you have. What do believers have? We've got joy, we've got peace, we've got vision. What's Jesus saying? When you go through delay, don't let the enemy steal your joy. Come on, when you go through struggle, don't let the powers of darkness blur your vision. Come on, when you go through tough times, don't let the cares and concerns of this day rob you of your peace because you know what you have will last for all eternity. Now, I know many of your stories, and I know some of you have been waiting a long time for your miracle. You've been praying, you've been believing, you've been holding on, but if you were honest with yourself this morning, you don't have to tell me, you don't have to tell your neighbor. If you were honest with yourself this morning, you may say, Pastor, I've been doing everything I can, but I'm not sure I can hold on much longer. And you came here today in a desperate place, wondering if you can make it. So I believe the Lord sent me here today to encourage somebody. Again, it might not be everybody, but I know it's for somebody. Don't give up now. Come on, don't give in today. Hold on to what you have in Jesus name. And I want to pause one more time and I want to pray for you. If you've been going through it, I want to pray. We don't need to wait till the end of service. Right where you are seated in a moment, I'm asking you to just lift a hand and reach out to heaven and hold on one more time. So let's bow our head. Let's close our eyes. And if you're in need of a touch from the Lord, you've been going through it. You've been waiting. You've been wondering. Come on, let's just lift up a hand. Let's reach out to heaven and hold on. Father, I'm praying for your children again in this moment, for your sons and for your daughters. I'm praying for 
strength to come upon your people. I'm praying for a spirit of resilience to enter into the building. I'm praying for renewed energy and restored hope that, Lord, you're going to touch them today and they will not give up. They're going to hold on to what they have in Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe that, say amen this morning. Amen. What do I know? Galatians 6, 9, the apostle Paul knew this. He said, don't become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up, if we faint not. So not only do we hold on to faith, a feeling, the, the belief system in our hearts, we've got to hold on to doing good. This is the faithfulness of our hands. Faith and faithfulness, waiting and working. Right, we said enduring patiently doesn't mean sitting idle with our hands folded, doing nothing till he comes again. No, we are called, dearly beloved, to make the most of the time we're given, however long that may be. On Friday night as we had the celebration of life service for Dave Dudley, I felt like that was the verse from Ephesians chapter five that the Lord gave me for that moment is that we should make the most of our time, make the most of our opportunity, make the most of our moments because the days are evil. And Dave Dudley, in the year and a half he was here before he went on to glory, he made the most of his time. I remember talking with him. He's like, I'm going here. I'm meeting with them. I'm doing this. I said, are you going to take a break? He said, I'll take a break in heaven. He finally got one, I guess. <laughs> but some of us, we're not really, you know, the goal when we get to heaven is to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Sadly, too many people are just going to hear, well, you're done. I mean it. Well done means you did something. You know, as believers, the judgment that we're going to have is not for our sin. Jesus has covered our sin. We've been forgiven. The Bible says as far from the east is to the west. So what's our judgment going to be based upon? It's not our sin because it's been forgotten. It's been forgiven. Our judgment's going to be based upon what we did. Some of us, the assessment's going to be over pretty quick. Amen. But we're called to make the most of our moments. Now, here's the deal. I confess to you today that as your pastor, as I look back in my life, I have not made the most of every moment that I was given. And before you look at me with such disdain, I would submit to you, I was going to say, you know, suspect, but I'm trying to use a different word, <laughs> that I'm not the only one in the room that can look back and there was a conversation that we missed that moment. We felt the Holy Spirit leading, that we, we, we encountered a family in need and we just weren't sure that, that there was a topic, a conversation, a door that we didn't make the most of every moment. Surely I'm not alone. Thank you for 24 honest people here today. And here's what I want you to know. As we look back, we don't look back and be filled with guilt to do nothing or to do less. When we look back at moments that we missed, we allow them to propel us to make sure we make the most of every moment we're given in the future. So I get it. You may have messed up with your kids five years ago or five minutes ago, but the next time you have the conversation, say, help me, Holy Spirit, make the most of this moment. We can't go backwards, but we will go forward. Don't get put down in guilt and shame and condemnation, but allow it to propel you to make the most of every moment that we've been given. Jesus said, do it so that no one will take your crown. Again, we're going to be judged and rewarded based upon what we've done, what we do for him, caring after, looking after orphans, widows, those hurting. That is what our judgment will be upon. And I pray none of us as good Minnesotans are trying to get into heaven just by the hair of our chinny chin chin. It's real, you somebody like, what does that have to do with Minnesotans? Have you seen the amount of full beards and flannel that we represent here in Minnesota? There's no chinny chin chin hair beards in Minnesota. They're full blown mountain man beards in Minnesota. And most of them are on the men. Okay, anyway, I'm just, that was funny. That was funny. Don't get so offended. Seriously, 
Don't get offended. That's a choice. All right? Now, we want to make the most of every moment we're given. Don't be surprised when you have opportunity this week and you go into a dark place. The Holy Spirit's with you. He's in you, shining the light of Christ wherever you go. Don't belittle or bemoan those moments that God gives you in those tough places because he's sending you, representing him to make the most while you're waiting and working. Third and finally, it's about pillars and promises. Pillars and promises. It says, the one who's victorious, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God. The message to Philadelphia shows us that blessings come when we maintain our faith despite life's tribulations. In fact, those who persevere despite weaknesses will one day stand strong as pillars in heaven. And I love that because the original hearer of that word would be a lot like us. And when we hear about pillars in the kingdom of God, when we hear about spiritual giants, right, in the kingdom of God, many of us would think of people like Peter and Paul. Peter was that disciple of Jesus. He was the loudmouth that always spoke up what other disciples were thinking. And I'm not talking about that part of it, but, but when, on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came, Peter spoke with boldness and 3,000 people got saved. Wow, Peter, that makes sense. He's a pillar, bold preaching, Holy Spirit empowered. That's something in the kingdom. How about the apostle Paul? He was Saul on his way to Damascus, gonna go do bad things to believers. Jesus met him, knocked him off his high horse. And he gave his life to Jesus Christ, was changed from the inside out. And through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he what? wrote about half of the New Testament. All of us would think, wow, there's a pillar in the kingdom of God. There's a spiritual giant. What was Jesus saying? Everybody who remains faithful, not just those that preach and 3,000 people get saved, not just those that give their life to Christ and write half the New Testament. Jesus says, if you are faithful. You know, one of the problems is we compare and contrast our spiritual giftings to those around us. And we think, oh, well, I guess I can't do as much in the kingdom as they do. We're only judged on our assignment. You know, it's not, well, they did more or less. He's judging us on what did he give us and what did we do with it? And these believers that, that stuck with it, that they were used, would be used to be part of what God is building, the place where his name would be continually worshiped which is incredible, isn't it right? We know according to the word that unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. He's gonna use us to build the place where his name is forever worshiped. Wow. The church in Philadelphia was characterized by a spirit of revival that promoted evangelism and missions. I love those descriptions. In fact, I'm praying that for our church, that we would live with a spirit of revival that would promote evangelism and missions. Not just spiritual goosebumps in the church service we're in. I'm thankful for that spirit of revival, but I'd like to see a spirit of revival that's characterized by passion for evangelism and missions. That people across the street and around the world are waiting to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's what this church in Philadelphia was for. A spirit of revival that would change every city we live in. That would change our neighborhoods and our schools and our businesses and beyond. What a great description for that church. The third characterization of that church in Philadelphia, hopefully we're doing it too, was good Bible teaching. We'll say the jury's out on that, but we're doing our best here today. Amen. So what am I saying? That we all have a part to play in the kingdom of God. There's not bigger or smaller or greater or lesser, just our part. And we all have a part to play. We don't compare our talents and abilities and say, oh, it's not as good as somebody else. We just have to be faithful in our assignment and God will use it in supernatural ways to build his kingdom through us. Remember last week, it's not about what we do for God, but, what about, he, what, but about what he does through us. When we get that perspective, we'll know there's 
no bigger or smaller or greater or lesser parts. It's just our part that he's called us to play in his kingdom. Jesus says, hold on to what you have. And then here we read, never again will they leave it. I'm gonna come back to that a little bit about what those believers in Philadelphia were going through. They had a lot of earthquakes and they would come and go and I'll come to that. But he, Jesus is saying, your crown is secure. Your reward is secure. You can choose to forfeit it, but it won't be on accident. But you know, we do see in scripture, people who forfeited lost their way, lost their place along their way. Think back, Old Testament, Esau lost his place to Jacob, sold his birthright for a bowl of stew, Campbell's, mm-mm, good. <laughs> Reuben, the oldest brother, lost his place to Judas. Saul, the king, lost his place to David because he wanted to do his own way. Judas, the disciple, lost his place to Matthias. <laughs> it can happen to anybody, but it won't happen to anyone unless they're careless. That's what I think we see here, right? That it's secure. Jesus promised us a new name. He said he'll write on us the name of our God and the name of the city of our God and what he opens, nobody can shut. So friends, hear me. If we have the name of God written on us, we have nothing to fear. This is the final push of the message today. I'm tired of seeing fearful believers, right? There, there is, this is a future promise that linked back to the original Passover when the blood was applied to the doorframe. Remember that? When it was going to be the death of the firstborn and Passover. He said, go and place blood on the pillars and the death angel would pass over. What I believe is if we have the name of God on us, any problem will pass over. Let me prove it to you. And then I'm going to offend a few more people and then we're going to end. Remember my joke early on. Ezekiel chapter nine and verse three. Now the glory, I was reading Ezekiel this week in my devotions. Now the glory of the God of Israel went up above the cherubim where it had been and moved to the threshold of the temple. Then the Lord called the man clothed in linen, called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing kit at his side and said to him, go throughout the city of Jerusalem and what? Put a mark on the foreheads. Passover. Put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are done in it. As I listened, he said to others, follow him through the city and kill without showing pity or compassion. Slaughter the old men, the young and women, the mothers and children. But catch this, but do not touch anyone who has the mark. When you're marked by God, destruction has to pass over. Now, this is a whole other message I don't have time for today. Look at what he says. Begin at my sanctuary. Just as a reminder for the people of God, judgment always begins in the house of God. So for every believer, it's like, God, this is the time. This is the moment. Just know he'll start with us. Go on. Revelation 14 and 1. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion with 144,000, check this, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. All right, here's the moment that I'm going to push a few people here today. I think believers, well-meaning, spirit-filled, Jesus-worshiping believers, have spent way too much time in our lives, focus and talking and worrying about the mark of the beast and not nearly enough focus, time, energy, effort on the mark of God on our lives. Remember I said I'd bring it back. I made a joke at the beginning about no six-point sermon. <laughs> Each week when I email out the manuscript, I just label it week one, two, three, so this is six. So normally when I email out the notes, I send it in pages because I type on an Apple computer and then I transfer it into Word so anybody with a PC and then I also put it into PDF so that people on their phone could read it. But there was no way I was gonna email three notes that said six, six, six. <laughs> so no PDF this week. You're not getting it. It's pages and Word, that's it. <laughs> and it's funny because even on the week where I was gonna write that, I couldn't help but avoid those numbers. As if sending an email with three documents titled 666 was gonna just strike me down from heaven. But if you grew up in churches like I did, you might have thought the same thing. You're like, yeah, Pastor, that makes sense. Can't be too careful. Don't send that email. Uh uh, not six points on the sermon, not 666 in the email.
Here's what I'm gonna pray for all of us before we leave, that we would just leave secure. Why? Because if his name's written on our forehead, if we bear the mark of God on our lives, there's no email, no number, no, let me just, how many people were serving the Lord back when grocery stores had, they got the barcode scanners? I know Pastor Dan, anybody else? Thank you, Sue, okay, two of you were old. I mean, are, were around. I don't know what I'm saying. It was the 70s, I wasn't here. And people were losing their mind because Cub Foods was like, $1.99. Oh, the mark of the beast! You know, when you got like barcode payment on your phone, people are like, mark of the beast. Any shot at the doctor, dare I say a vaccine, people are like, mark of the beast. I remind you, no mark of the beast is gonna be accidental. You're not like, oh, I just wanted groceries, now I'm going to hell. That's not the deal. <laughs> Bless the symbols here this morning too. It's not the deal. Represents a deliberate choice that says, I'm gonna turn my back on Jesus and I'm going to trust someone or something else. Don't go through life in such fear. Don't go through life as a believer walking on eggshells with your salvation. Jesus is saying, you are secure for all of eternity. So when Jesus said, never again will they leave it, right? The city of Philadelphia, they'd been going through, they had a lot of long and devastating series of earthquakes. And when that happened, they would flee their home, they'd run out into the countryside, and when the tremors, tremors would end, they would return. Their daily lives, the people of Philadelphia, were filled with insecurity as they were constantly wondering when they would have to run away again. Listen, I think it's a description of how many believers are living their lives today. Totally insecure, always worried, when are we going to have to run away again? Never if you bear the mark of God on your life. That doesn't mean tough times aren't going to come. It doesn't mean there won't be struggles. But I'm telling you, friends, you and I are eternally secure when we bear the mark of God on our lives. When we choose to live for him. No accidental choice. No temporary situation. No problem. We don't need another book on that mark. Let's focus on the mark of God on our lives. If you're able, would you stand this morning? And I want to pray. I know our time is gone, but I want to pray. In a moment, we'll sing one more time. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And I'm gonna pray for every person that you would leave secure in your faith in Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you're not right with God, there's sin in your life, you can leave forgiven. It's not about a fancy prayer or magic words, but, but just a desire in your heart that says, Lord Jesus, I give my life to you. I repent of my sin. I change my ways. I'm not gonna live for myself. I'm gonna live for you. And the Bible says the old will be gone, the new will come. You'll be forgiven and you will bear the mark of God on your life. And you never have to worry. Well, what's gonna happen in the economy? I don't know. It's gonna go down. It's gonna go up. Eventually it'll go down again and Jesus will come back. I just saved you an economic report right there. But one day, how about one more set of verses? Revelation 22 and one, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On the side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And look at this. He says, no longer will there be any curse. The curse that came upon us was not work. It was that work was difficult. Adam and Eve were already working in the garden. But God said when sin came in, that punishment was going to be difficult. There will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. That's going to be our joy forever, working in the kingdom of God. And look at this. And I'll close. I'll pray. Verse number four. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. You don't have to live in fear one more day. 
because there will be no more night. We will not have need of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord our God will give the light, and we will reign forever and ever. Our future is secure, friends, and we don't have to live in fear. So whether you're not right with God and you want to be, maybe you're here, you've been doing your best to serve Jesus, but you're like, I don't know, I've been worrying that I'm going under. I'm going to pray that you're going to leave secure in your faith, knowing that your reward is secure. Would you bow your head and close your eyes as I pray here today? Heavenly Father, I'm praying for each and every person under the sound of my voice in this room or watching online, even at a later time. I'm praying that each and every one would be secure in our faith in you. If there's someone here that are not right with you, may they repent of their sin. May they make a turnaround, a change, be re- changed from the inside out, that they would be renewed through living for you. So, Father, we pray that in Jesus' name. For those that have been living for you, have been doing their best to serve you, I pray for a strength, a security to come upon them that they would know they don't have to live 